So um, <coughs> make sure you uh, get yourself comfortable because I've got uh, 24 pages of notes. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, not very many slides. As we're dealing with uh, explorers, so uh, a lot of the history we're talking about predates uh, photography. Yeah. So it was a little trickier to find visuals to, to go with this one. But I uh, wanted to talk about um, the explorers that uh, were in this region. I call it explorers in the Selkirks, but I am going to be um, heading into the Rockies a little bit as well to, uh, as, we, as we go along. So, starting with uh, David Thompson, um, before I really talk about uh, the European explorers through this area, I think it, uh, all we always need to be aware that, of course, there were people here. Mm -hmm. uh, there were people that were already very familiar with uh, with this region and with the, the passes. Uh, so when we talk about um, you know, a lot of the, the early explorers talked about discovering things, well, they weren't really discovering things, they were surveying and uh, exploring. But uh, I think it's safe to say that most of the terrain in this area had already been discovered and was being lived in and used by the First Nations people, both by the Sinaiaks who lived on the, the Columbia River system. And there's, there's definitely um, c conflicting information about how far past Revelstoke their territory extended, but their territory did extend at least to Revelstoke. They probably did go into the, the Big Bend area north of here, but we don't know the full extent of their, their use. Uh, we'll be seeing in a little while some of the trails that were used by the, the First Nations between the, um, uh, the, between the Shushwap Lake and uh, the, the Columbia River. So they were definitely here. You know, they were definitely using the landscape. Um, so, but David Thompson is credited as the, the first European explorer to come through this area. Uh, he was born in England in 1770. And uh, at the age of 70, he, se at the age of seven, he was sent away to a, what they called a charity school. I guess he was seen to have some promise, and they felt that he could be trained. So he was, um, he showed an aptitude in math. So he was being prepared for a career as a midshipman in the Royal Navy. Um, he was uh, got a lot of instruction in uh, in math, and algebra. Uh, trigonometry, geography, and, and navigation using practical astronomy. At uh, the age of 14, he was sent to Canada as an apprentice with the Hudson Bay Company and uh, left, uh, in, left England in May of 1784. Uh, he began uh, travels uh, to, with the uh, Hudson Bay Company survey crews. Um, at one point, he had a, an accident. Uh, he uh, fell and broke his leg. And it was uh, severe, and in those days, they didn't have a lot of uh, uh, proper medication. So it, it was actually, uh, it, they didn't think he was going to make it for several weeks. It was a full year before he fully recovered. He had a limp for the rest of his life, which is remarkable when you think of the amount of territory that he walked and paddled for the rest of his career. I also became blind in his right eye. And it was uh, said that that was possibly because of, uh, from observing the sun without proper eye protection. Uh, when he uh, left his apprenticeship, he was given a lot of uh, equipment, the sextant, an artificial horizon, and a compass, and a thermometer, and uh, various other pieces of equipment that he needed for his, uh, his uh, geographical uh, survey work. Uh, at the age of uh, 27, he left the Hudson Bay Company and joined the rival uh, Northwest Company. He felt that the uh, Hudson Bay Company was uh, more focused just on, on trade and commerce, and he was more interested in exploration at that time. So he thought that he had more scope to explore and survey and do mapping with uh, <coughs> the Northwest Company. In uh, 1799, he married uh, Charlotte Small, who was uh, the daughter of a Northwest Company partner and a, a First Nations Cree woman. Uh, they had 13 children together over the course of their, their time. They, they were married for about 60 years and died within three months of each other. Wow. <clears throat> In uh, 1806, the Northwest uh, Company had made the decision to make an attempt to open trade with the First Nations west of the Rocky Mountains. And uh, so, um, Thompson set out for Rocky Mountain House, which is not too far from Red Deer. 
and uh, they uh, spent uh, the winter of 1806-1807 there, and then in, uh, 18, er, in May of 1807, uh, Thompson and his family, along with uh, Finn and MacDonald, who was uh, a, a partner of his, and eight other voyageurs, set out to cross the Rocky Mountains. And they traveled up the North Saskatchewan River, past Kootenai Plains, and over what would be later known as House Pass. They descended the Blaeberry River to the Columbia, although at the time they didn't know that it was the Columbia. They arrived there in June of 1806. And um, so they ascended the river and arrived at uh, Lake Windermere on July 18th. Uh, they built Kootenai House there and spent the winter trading. Uh, over between 1808 and 1810, he continued his exploration in the Kootenays and into Montana and Idaho, and they were trading along the way. In um, September of 1810, he uh, was at Rocky Mountain House, and he discovered that the Pagan First Nation uh, did not want them to cross through their territory any longer. They, were they didn't like them trading with the, the Kootenay or the Tanaha, and uh, so they, they uh, were blocking them from passing through their territory. So uh, Thompson decided that he would look for a more northerly route. So they went uh, from the north branch of the Saskatchewan to the Athabasca River and across the mountains to the, to the Columbia. That, were, that, was, that was their plan. So they set out from Rocky Mountain House uh, at the end of October 1810. And it took them 38 days to reach uh, what's now Jasper Park. They had 24 men with them at the time. They paused to make dog sleds and snowshoes, and then they set out from Jasper over the Athabasca Pass on uh, December 29th. And you wonder what, what were they thinking, <laughs> really? Uh, they weren't able to use horses because of the deep snow, and even the, uh, the dogs and the dog sleds had difficulty. They, um, their game and food were scarce, and they ended up sending quite a few of the men back to Rocky Mountain House. Uh, some of them uh, were supposed to pick up more provisions and return back to the party. Some of them didn't return to the expedition. Um, so at the end, they uh, started at the uh, Miet River, just upstream from the present Jasper town site. And uh, they already they were having to lighten their load. And they left one man behind to establish a camp. At uh, early January of 1811, they left the last of their horses on the east side of the Athabasca and approached well, what he referred to as a broad uh, defile, the way to the pass. They had uh, 13 men on snowshoes and eight dog sleds crossing the main Athabasca, and they turned west and south up Whirlpool River. They were trudging through up to seven feet of snow. Uh, five days after the Whirlpool River, the snow and wind abated. He said, the view now before us was an ascent of deep snow, in all appearance to the height of land between the Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans. It was to me an exhilarating sight, but to my uneducated men, the sense of desolation before us was dreadful. A heavy gale of wind, much more a mountain storm, would have buried us beneath it, but thank God the weather was fine. Then on January 4th, he wrote in his journal, up this river is the canoe road, to pass to the canoe river on the west side, the mountains, and so down to the Kootenai River. It is also by this stream that is opposite us, <clears throat> that the large animal, so much spoken of as haunting about here, was seen and supposed to be the mammoth. And I, I think that's just amazing. They were trudging in the middle of winter in this deep, deep snow, and they were worried that they were mammoths there. Yeah. Uh, they're the, uh, some of the First Nations people were talking about, uh, the, one person talked about his grandfather having seen a mammoth and being so terrified by it that he couldn't speak for, for the rest of his life. And when he talked about grandfather, we don't know how far back, you know, the, how, it could have been a great, 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 great grandfather, we don't know that. But they saw this track of a large animal and they were all terrified. He said uh, it has four large toes, about three or four inches long and a small nail at the end of each. The ball of his foot sunk, sank about three inches deeper than his toes. The hinder part of his foot did not mark well. The hole is about 14 inches long by 8 inches wide and very much resembles a large bear's track. It was on the rivulet in about 6 inches snow. Said one man has asserted that his grandfather told him he saw one of these animals in a mountain pass where he was hunting and that on hearing its roar, which he compared to loud thunder 
The sight almost left his eyes, and his heart became as small as an infant's. And he later said, uh, I never appeared to give credence to these reports, for they appeared to arise from that fondness for the marvelous, so common to mankind. But the sight of the track of that large beast staggered me, and I often thought of it, yet could never bring myself to believe such an animal existed, but thought it might be the track of some monster bear. Uh, it was, you can, as you can imagine, it was a very difficult uh, trip. The uh, men were hungry, tired, and frustrated. Finally, on January 10th, they reached the top of the Athabasca Pass. And uh, Thompson wrote, Many reflections came to my mind. A new world was in a manner before us, and my object was to be at the Pacific Ocean before the month of August. How we were to find provisions, and how many men would remain with me, for they were dispirited. Amidst various thoughts, I fell asleep on my bed of snow, and the descent to the Columbia began the next day. So, uh, following the, uh, the Wood River, they reached the forks of the Columbia and Canoe Rivers on January 18, 1811. Now, this is a 1915 map, but uh, you can see up here, this is, well, this is where they were coming from, and this is where the Wood and the Canoe Rivers hit the Columbia. It's just above where the Mica Dam is now. And that's the, the top of what's referred to as the Big Bend. Um, so finally, on um, the, the 23rd, they, well, they, on January 18, 1811, they reached uh, the forks of the Columbia and the Canoe Rivers. And they tried to press on um, upstream on the Columbia and until the 23rd. But the going was too hard, so they returned to the conjunction of the rivers. And they named that area Boat Encampment. Uh, they had only traveled 12 miles in four days. So on January 26th, uh, back at Bowdoin Encampment, uh, the three men deserted. And, you know, where do you desert to? <laughs> <laughs> so I guess they would have gone back over the Athabasca Pass. Another was ill. Thompson sent two others with letters to be delivered to William Henry of the Northwest Company, asking for more trading goods. And uh, two men, uh, Villad and Lamaru remained with Thompson and they began building a crude hut. He said, our residence was near the junction of two rivers from the mountains with the Columbia. The upper stream which forms the defile by which we came to the Columbia, I named Flat Heart from the men being dispirited. The other was the Canoe River. The Flat Heart was later known as the Wood River. Uh, the, our hut was somewhere between the mouths of the two rivers. So they ended up uh, staying there until the spring. They, they couldn't travel on, on the river. The river was frozen. So they uh, stayed there until uh, April of 1811. In the meantime, uh, Thompson built a canoe. And uh, he had, he had, a, couple, he had a, a two pound ax with him. So he built a cedar plank canoe using this two pound ax. And they used moose, head, moose hide twine to tie it together. It was uh, what was, they obviously didn't have any nails, so it was what they called clinker built, where they are, or lap straight, where the, the boards were overlapped over each other. Um, so finally they, uh, they set up out, so uh, that was their, their winter at the Boat Encampment. Boat Encampment uh, was in use for quite some time after that during the fur trade. This was a painting done of the boat encampment by uh, Paul Kane, who was a well-known uh, artist who traveled through the Canadian West in the, the 1840s and did lots of, uh, of painting of, uh, along the way. And um, just so you can see the comparison, you can just see the look at the height of his mountains there. And this was a photo by Earl Dickey of the site at Boat Encampment. So you can see it uh, definitely can recognize the mountains, although they're somewhat higher in Paul Kane's uh, version of it. So they uh, left Boat Encampment, uh, traveled uh, upriver from, um, um, from Boat Encampment to the mouth of, uh, of uh, Blayberry. And uh, this, they were traveling through new country at that time. That hadn't been previously traveled by any of the, the European explorers. Uh, there was still deep snow and not a lot of game, so it was slow going. Um, they, um, it took them almost uh, a month to, uh, to travel 120 miles 
uh, to reach Blayberry Creek. By then he was back on familiar ground and they headed down to, uh, to Washington State and to Spokane House, uh, Kettle Falls. And on July uh, 3rd, 1811, he started down the Columbia and uh, put up a notice at the mouth of the Snake River on July 9th. Know hereby that this country is claimed by Great Britain and that the Northwest Company of Merchants from Canada do hereby intend to erect a factory in this place for the commerce of the country around. And uh, on uh, July 15th, 1811, Dressed in his best European clothes, he reached the, the Pacific. But of course, by then, uh, Astor had already reached the Pacific and had claimed that area for the uh, uh, for the United States. So um, there's a lot of speculation about uh, whether the Northwest Company had already done a deal with uh, with Astor, and uh, they'd already uh, conceded that that area and the the mouth of the the Columbia. But there's a lot that's all all speculation. In any case, um, Thompson had made it to the, to the mouth of the Columbia and uh, from there he uh, headed back up, uh, up, uh, upstream on the Columbia and um, his idea was to, his plan was to get back to boat encampment by which time he would have traveled the entire Columbia River and he was the first person to have ever done that. And of course he was mapping all along the way. Um, on September 2nd, they headed north, and three days later, they were at the site of present-day Castlegar. They uh, traveled up through the Arrow Lakes, and on September 10th, he was uh, getting close to where we, where Rubblestock is now. He said, the current is so strong that at first sight, one would scarcely suppose it possible to stem it, even with a tow line. But on more attentive observation, it is found that in every reach, there is a strong buck back current, or eddy which renders it easy of ascent. And this appears to be occasioned by the serpentine force of the river, running with great strength against the points, which forced the, the water up in shore. On September 12th, he was at the Little Dalles, which is the area just north of Revelstoke, below where the dam is now. And he said that that was a very bad stretch of water. He uh, described it as a very dangerous rapid, where the water falls nine feet over large stones the past which took all our united strength, two in the boat guiding her and seven on the line, carried all my articles lest evil should o overtake them. <laughs> this night from exertion I can hardly write. Then on September 11th they camped two miles above present day Revelstoke. On September 14th they lined the, what was known as uh, Dal de Mor or Death Rapids and uh, got through safely, and on September 18th, back at Bolton encampment. Uh, on September 18th, he said, uh, wrote in his journal, a misty morn, dried my tent, gummed the canoe, and at 7.15 set off 16 courses to our old hut, thank heaven. We searched about to see if anyone had been there, but finding no marks of any person, we set up a few lines in Iroquois, as we supposed only those people would pass here. So that was uh, the next year, 1812, was Thompson's last uh, trip on the Columbia. He uh, returned east and uh, spent a lot of time doing mapping uh, through his, his trips. His maps were greatly used at the, at the time, but he never received a lot of, uh, of um, compensation for his work. Uh, he ended up dying in poverty. <coughs> um, he was, you know, quite uh, actually quite elderly at the time that he died. Uh, we've got a copy on the wall of one of his maps, and a copy of it here too. And uh, of course, he didn't really go into the Selkirks, from what we can tell. But uh, so there's a lot of the the land. This is he refers to the Selkirks as Nelson's Mountains, and the Kootenay River is referred to as McGilvery's River. But um, you can see that he's got the, the basic outline of, of the Big Bend. Um, his marking, mapping was remarkable yeah, for the day and for the kind of equipment that he had. So, um, his work opened up this area for the fur trade. So from that time on, there were a lot of people traveling the Columbia River going through this area. The, um, I'm going to skip over a little bit to the um, 
to the Rockies because I think we need to talk about the Palliser expedition as well. It was really influential for the opening of this country and definitely for the, the coming of the railway. Um, Palliser was um, an adventurer and a sportsman, originally from uh, Britain. And uh, he, after uh, some wanderings in the US and Canada, he uh, made a proposition to the British government to explore Western Canada in order to open up the country for settlement and to explore possible mountain passes for railway routes. Uh, he was made a fellow of the Royal Ge Geographical Society in England and received their backing for his proposal. Um, just realized I missed a couple of slides that were related to Thompson, so I'm just going to backtrack a bit. This was a cairn that was um, uh, put up in, the, in 1953 at Boat Encampment. And of course, that area is now uh, part of the Mica Dam Reservoir. Uh, when they were clearing for the reservoir, they removed the, the plaque from uh, that, and it was supposed to have been sent back to Ottawa to be destroyed because it was unilingual. And for some reason, it ended up in the basement of the museum. When I started working here in 1983, we found it in, it was in the basement. And we spent hours trying to clean it because it, I think it had gotten thrown onto a clearing file and fire. And actually, some of the, some of the writing was, was actually melted off, but we managed to clean it up reasonably well, and it's on display downstairs right now. There's the picture of the, uh, so they had it on, on quite a, a big platform there and uh, unveiled that in 1953. So there's a small sign marking now, marking both encampment now. <coughs> so uh, anyway, we're so we're on to uh, the Palliser expedition, and uh, one of the um, partners in the Palliser expedition was James Hector, who was um, born in uh, Scotland in 18. Uh, 34. He uh, trained as a medical doctor, but he also had a real interest in uh, natural sciences, especially geology. Uh, he uh, joined the, uh, the joined Palliser and uh, came out for to uh, work on the Palliser expedition. They were to travel from the Red River Colony in Manitoba uh, to and through the Rocky Mountains along the unsurveyed American boundary. It was also to be a scientific expedition amassing meteorological, geological, and magnetic data, and collecting botanical specimens. In August of 1858, they reached the Rockies, and uh, Palliser divided the party. So uh, James Hector, accompanied by a botanist, and uh, an, another scientist, and their guide, uh, Peter Erasmus, and a stony First Nations man referred to as Nimrod, uh, they went further up the Bow Valley. Um, so Hector and his party traveled up the Kootenai Valley and over the low pass to the headwaters of the Beaverfoot River, then followed the Beaverfoot to its confluence with the Kicking Horse River near Wapta Falls. They ascended the Kicking Horse and passed over Kicking Horse Pass. They turned just before reaching what would become Mount Hector and traveled north past what George Dawson would later name Hector Lake to the headwaters of the Bow River. They finally reached North Saskatchewan River and then eventually Fort Edmonton. So that's sort of the, the capsule version of their trip. But um, the big story of that trip is uh, why the Kicking Horse River got its name and who got kicked. Um, then that was James Hector. He said um, on uh, August 29th, 1858, they descended the Beaverfoot River. He said, we had traveled a few miles when we came to a large flat where the wide valley terminated, dividing into two branch valleys, one from the northwest and the other from the southwest. Here we met a very large stream, equal in size to the Bow River, where we crossed it. This river descends the valley of Beaverfoot River, turns back on its course at a sharp angle, receives that river as a tributary, and flows off to the southwest through the other valley. Just above the angle, there is a fall about 40 feet in height where the channel is contra contracted by perpendicular rocks. A little way above this fall, one of our pack horses, to escape the fallen timber, plunged into the stream, luckily where it formed an eddy, but the banks were so steep that we had great difficulty in getting him out. In attempting to recatch my own horse, which had strayed off while we were engaged with the one in the water, he kicked me in the chest. 
but I had luckily got close to him before he struck out, so that I did not get the full force of the blow. However, it knocked me down and rendered me senseless for some time. This was unfortunate, as we had seen no tracks of game in the neighborhood, and were now without food. But I was so hurt we could not uh, proceed further that day at least. My men covered me up under a tree, and I sent them all off to try and raise something to eat. Actually, Hector uh, became unconscious, and um, the, his men actually thought he had died. They couldn't find a pulse at one point. So they, they started digging his grave. And uh, when Hector woke up, he said, uh, I woke in time to behold my grave yawning for me. <laughs> my friends had decided I was dead, and they were doing the last respectful act, putting me under the sod. I did not use that grave. Instead, they named the river the Kicking Horse and gave the pass, which we made our way through a few days later, the same name. But they were still in pretty bad straits. He was, uh, he was in terrible pain. And because he was a trained medical doctor, he had a medical kit with him. And he asked uh, Peter Erasmus to prepare a medicinal concoction. But Erasmus was worried about uh, making a mistake and being responsible for the doctor's death. So we had Hector sign a document stating the facts of the accident in case his illness proved fatal. Um, they, at that point, they didn't know what they were, where they were. They were without food. Um, they um, were not successful in finding any game. So the next day, um, they, um, well, they, they uh, as in a couple of days, they had uh, um, five pounds of pemmican, but that was only about a day's worth of, of food. So um, they finally managed to lift Hector onto his horse within a couple of days and began to ascend the Kicking Horse River. And uh, they reached the, the height of land that would later become known as Kicking Horse Pass. And they descended the pass to the Bull River. And Nimrod went off to hunt and returned with a moose. So all was good. And they, they managed to, from there, complete their expedition and get onto Fort Edmonton. Um, Hector continued exploration over the winter and uh, did some work in the, in the Banff um, uh, Bull River area the next year. He um, finally returned, to, after being in Canada for three years, he returned to England. And then in 1862, he went to New Zealand, where he became uh, director of the geological survey in uh, New Zealand. He was eventually elected the chancellor of New Zealand University uh, received many awards. Uh, in 1903, the CPR had a promotional campaign to lure tourists to the mountains, and they planned to invite prominent people to help with their promotion. Two in particular were James Hector and Edward Quimper, who was a famous climber of the Swiss Alps. And they planned for the two men to meet on August 16, 1903 at Glacier House. Uh, James brought his 26-year-old uh, son, uh, Douglas, with him. They arrived at Glacier House on August 14, 1903. Uh, Mayor, Mary Schaefer, who was a well-known climber and uh, botanist and writer, uh, said, uh, I was sitting quietly at the small rotunda of the little hotel sketching when my ears caught this remark, I mean to see my grave. Then came the profound thump of a fist on the counter of the office. One naturally takes an interest in anyone who's on the hunt of their own grave. And as I was always looking for anyone who had any history at his tongue's end, I slipped from my chair and quietly went to the desk to see if I could discover anything new. The charming hostess was listening to a rather undersized and very emphatic man, rather stout, who looked to be at least 70. Though later I wondered if, if his work might not have aged him. He would have been 69 then. So that evening, uh, Hector entertained several of the guests with his stories. But they became aware that uh, Douglas was in quite a bit of pain and had hardly eaten any of his, his dinner. They determined that he had appendicitis, so they arranged to send him to the Revelstoke Hospital the next morning. Um, he arrived at the hospital where he was operated on, but peritonitis had set in, and he died in Revelstoke on Sunday, August 16th. And of course, at that time, it would have been extremely difficult to send a body back to, to New Zealand. So he was buried in Revelstoke. And uh, a couple of years later, the, uh, there was a, a fund uh, put together. So the uh, A.O. Wheeler, who was head of the Selkirk uh, exploration of the Selkirk Range the Ge Geographical Survey, and uh, Thomas Kilpatrick, who was uh, CPR superintendent, 
raise money for a monument. So if you go up to the cemetery and you see the, the big um, stone that's the size and shape of a grave, that's the grave of, of Douglas Hector, who's still lying in uh, the Revelstoke Cemetery. Uh, they also, um, at the same time, they also put a monument to uh, in honor of James Hector at um, Lake Louise, but that was later moved to the to the Great Divide. So um, at that time, uh, Hector went back to New Zealand, where he died uh, a few years later, 1907, at the age of 73. Um, the other fellow we're talking about is uh, Walter Moberly who's uh, really a, an outstanding uh, person in terms of the survey work in British Columbia. He was born in England in 1832 and um, came to uh, Esquimalt in the Victoria area in 1859. Um, he uh, went to, um, to Fort Langley and on the way, uh, Colonel Moody of the Royal Engineers uh, showed Moberly the site that they'd chosen for the future capital of BC at New Westminster and asked Moberly to survey it and supervise the construction of the first building. So Moberly uh, laid out the original town of New Westminster. Uh, they also, he did a lot of uh, survey work on the uh, Burrard Inlet and uh, through Van, uh, the, what's now Vancouver. Uh, he noted that the site of the present city of Vancouver was a perfect location for a future great port city. Uh, in uh, 1859, he cut a trail through the thick forest from New Westminster to Burrard Inlet, what is now Port Moody. He worked with uh, Edward Dudney on the Dudney Trail from Hope to the Southern Interior. And they also did uh, uh, construction on the Caribou Road. So he was uh, really involved in uh, survey work and uh, cons road construction in the interior. Uh, he was a uh, member of the Legislative Assembly at, for uh, some time, but uh, he was, um, after his first term, he was appointed uh, Assistant Surveyor General for the Colony of BC. Uh, his, one of his first assignments under that new title was to explore the territory east of Kamloops to the Columbia River. So in June of 1865, Moberly, with his assistant, Albert Perry, and a First Nations man named Victor, went from Fort Langley to Yale to Kamloops, and from the South Thompson to the Shuswap and Mirror Lakes, which they explored. And they then went up the Eagle River for several miles. Um, now, Moberly was also uh, charged with, uh, at that time the, the gold rush was on in the Big Bend, <coughs> and they were trying to find good routes from the, uh, from the Shuswap into the Columbia River because they they were losing there was a lot of trade being lost by miners coming up to Columbia from uh, from the United States so they wanted to find a good uh, good route so he was looking at the, at the trails in the uh, in this region it's another picture of Moberly as an, an old older man um, so back to this map um, we got to get in a bit closer to find the trails but there were there was a, there was a, an existing trail somewhere up in here that was referred to as a, uh, as a First Nations trail. And then Moberly's trail uh, came out here approximately across from Downey Creek. So that was the, the trail that, that, that Moberly surveyed. He was, um, he definitely was using uh, some existing First Nations trails because there was already a lot of, of use of, of that area by the First Nations. Um, now, um, Moberly is credited with discovering uh, Eagle Pass, and he, they, they definitely use that, that word. His, uh, you know, the, at the time, they, they said that he discovered it. But I've heard a lot of accounts from the First Nations people who, who, who have stories going back that their, their ancestors were using Eagle Pass long before that. But um, he, had, he actually has two different accounts of uh, finding Eagle Pass. Uh, one of them, his original one that was not long after he'd been here, was he said, on the top of a tree near the mouth of the Eagle River, I saw a nest full of eaglets and the two old birds sitting on a limb of the same tree. I had nothing but a small revolver in the shape of firearms. This I did, discharged eight or nine, nine times at the nest, but could not knock it down. The two old birds, after circling the nest, flew up the valley of the river, 
It struck me that if I followed them, I might find the much wished for pass. Two or three weeks later, when I explored the valley and was successful in finding a good pass, I thought the most appropriate name I could give it was Eagle Pass. And then the second story, which is in this um, book called Blazing the Trail Through the Rockies, the story of Walter Moberly and his share in the making of Vancouver by Noel Robinson and the old man himself. And this was um, published in uh, 1914. And um, in this, so quite a bit later, and in this story he said, um, I watched the eagles as they flew up the Columbia, and I saw them make a big bend off. I knew that all eagles always follow along the stream or make for an opening in the mountains, and I just followed the direction they took, with the result that I discovered, and I think very appropriately named, Eagle Pass. So uh, take your pick. He either uh, entered it first from, uh, from Sycamus or from uh, Revelstoke. But um, he, had, he had been in this area with uh, First Nations guides. They had been in the, um, on the Columbia River uh, down to Galena Bay. And uh, they traveled, um, so they were, they were in that area um, and then also back in this area. He actually spent a, uh, a winter in, uh, in this, what's now the Revelstoke area, most likely in the Big Eddy area. So he's very, very familiar with this area. He was, um, everybody at that time was sort of looking for possible railway route through the mountains. So that was one of the, the things that he was looking for as well. Some of his uh, survey work got a little bit slowed down because he was also named Gold Commissioner. So he ended up having to spend a lot of time recording claims while he was here as well. He also laid out French Creek City at um, on, uh, where the, um, the French Creek comes into the Gold Stream River, which then goes into the Columbia. And he did lay out some other uh, gold rush town sites at that time. Um, he did a lot of uh, survey work through, through the, he actually did uh, go through a pass uh, through the Big Bend and over to the, around what's now the Donald area. And uh, there is, you um, can't find it on the map, and that it's too small scale. But somewhere in there, there is an area known as Moberly Pass. And, um, yeah, well, the, there's Moberly Station by the railway, but there's a Moberly Pass through the mountain somewhere, uh, somewhere in, in that area. Um, but his idea was that, uh, Moberly's idea was that the railway would, would come up the Columbia and the Moberly Pass, and then down through Eagle Pass that way. Um, he was, he always, in his later days, he was always bitter about them choosing the Rogers Pass, and he claimed that Rogers was never actually in the pass, that he never set foot in the area. And, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's easily disputed by other material that we've got. But uh, he was actually, I think in his later days, was quite bitter about uh, the, the decisions they made on, on the railway. But uh, he definitely deserves a lot of credit for the survey work that he did in this area. And um, just a little segue on that. We're uh, this, in uh, the end of May, we're hosting the BC Historical Federation Conference. And on the Friday, uh, May 27th, there will be a reception at the Railway Museum that evening and they will be unveiling a monument to Walter Moberly. The BC Historical Federation has been working with the city and the Railway Museum to have this monument placed. So it'll be, um, they were always concerned as uh, BC historians, especially some of the engineers amongst the group that Moberly never got his due. Uh, there, there was a uh, Moberly Park, uh, where Moberly Manor is now, was named after Moberly. And there was a little cairn there that was unveiled in the 1950s, and that one's now over at the Railway Museum as well. But they felt that, that they're, it's not at the Railway Museum. Okay. Yes, it is. Yeah. It's MIA? No. No, it's at the no, Railway Museum. No, it's at the Railway Museum. The, the little Moberly cairn? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Guess what? They're not right. This new cairn that they're building will take place. Today. The plaque off the old one will be on the new one. Oh, okay. So it'll be... Yeah. Yeah. The other one's not there anymore. Yeah, okay. He sounds like kind of quite a bitter guy. Uh, 
Yeah, I think he. Um, I think he was in his later days. I think he was uh, disappointed. He felt that uh, the that the railway didn't make the good decisions about uh, where the where the railway line should have been. And uh, I think he, he felt that he didn't get the recognition he deserved. He could have been right. You know, he. It well, he had two different stories for his discovery of the past. I mean, that kind of. Well, it's probably it's a getting a little right old there. then, and you know, everybody who tells stories, including me, knows that sometimes you embellish things a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just, just listen to me in another 20 years and see if you <laughs> you've got the video evidence, you can compare my stories. That's right. <laughs> see if they do. You're doomed. <laughs> um, just, I know I'm running a little late today, but I'll just uh, quickly talk about uh, a bit about Major Rogers. I think um, all of these people deserve their own talks, and I actually have done talks on these first three before uh, to go into more detail. But um, <coughs> let's see, I'm Major Rogers here. So Major Rogers was was another pretty extraordinary fellow. Um, from uh, 1871 to 1880, the Dominion government had been uh, doing railway surveying and exploration, and um, and Sir Sanford Fleming, who also deserves a talk on his own one day, was uh, the original um, chief engineer for the, uh, to determine the railway line across Canada. In 1881, the Canadian Pacific Railway Company was formed, and um, with uh, George Stephen, Donald Smith, and others, and uh, as the partners, and William Cornelius Van Horn as general manager. And at the time, they hired uh, Major Albert Bowman Rogers as their engineer in charge of the Mountain Division. Uh, Rogers was born in Massachusetts in 1829, uh, graduated at Yale, and studied as a civil and railway engineer. He worked on several U.S. railways and was in charge of the Mountain Division of the CPR from 1881 to 1885. He was known as the Railway Pathfinder. So the um, Management of the CPR decided that they were originally looking at the Yellowhead Pass uh, for the railway, but they wanted a more southerly route. So that led them to the examination of the Bull River and the Hector Passes and the Valley of the Columbia. Uh, they uh, considered following the bend of the Columbia, but the distance of over 200 miles deterred them. Major Rogers was focused on finding a straighter path through the Selkirk Range. In 1881, he traveled up the forks of the Illasola and proceeded up the Southerly Branch, which Moberly had not taken. When Moberly was here, they had gone up the North Fork of the, of the Illasolwet. They wanted to explore, explore further on the, the South Fork, but the uh, guides that they had with them refused to, to go into it at that time of year. Uh, so Moberly had, never, had, had not ever gone up the, uh, the South Fork of the Illasolwet. Uh, so they ascended to the site of the former Glacier Hotel, where um, they uh, climbed a mountain. He was with uh, one of the people with them was his uh, nephew Albert, and um, he said, um, "There, Al, his nephew, and I stood. We could trace through the mountains a valley, and the conclusion was established in my mind that it led to the unexplored branch of the Illasolwet. We also traced a depression to the east, which we considered might lead to the upper waters of the Columbia, and so it proved." But at the end of 1881, he left a party at the mouth of the Kicking Horse River with instructions to make surveys and like explorations during the winter. And you can imagine that was probably a fun winter uh, <laughs> expedition as well. Uh, the next spring, there were three engineering parties uh, placed in the field. One to commence location from the summit of the Rockies eastward, another from the summit westward, and a third to commence ex exploratory, exploratory work in the Silkert Range. On, um, this is uh, from a uh, Selkirk Range uh, book by uh, A.O. Wheeler. It was published in 1905. He says, on May 22, 1882, Major Rogers started from the Columbia River camp across the Selkirks, but owing to high water, was unable to pass over the range. He returned by way of the Spilmachine River and reached the Columbia about 50 miles above the mouth of the Kicking Horse, and so found a very good route for a pack trail to the Beaver River near the mouth of Bear Creek. On July 17th, he made a second trip into the Selkirks by way of Beaver River, taking two white men and three First Nations men. On the 24th, they found a practicable line across the summit and down the easterly branch of the Losilowit. The survey party was set to survey and cut the trail. In 1882, 
They completed exploration by ascending the Beaver River Valley to Bear Creek, a tributary stream, then up that stream through the rugged defile between Mounts McDonald and Tupper to the summit of the pass and over it to the Illisilhouette Valley. Now this is just a very brief summary of, uh, of uh, Roger's work, but um, as I said, I already had you know, 24 pages on the other guys. <laughs> so I think it's worth another time where we can maybe oh, we'll talk a little bit more about some of the work that, that Rogers did. Um, it's another one of his really amazing characters. Uh, he was often referred to as Hell's Bells Rogers. He had this habit of cussing quite a bit and uh, chewing on chewing tobacco. And it's also said that he had a rather odd constitution. He could live on beans and not much else. And so his men were always complaining that they were starving and not being properly fed. So, uh, quite a character, and had those awesome, um, that awesome mustache too. Mm -hmm. This is a picture of uh, Rogers Pass during railway construction in 1885. So uh, yeah, I've rattled on for a long time here. Does anybody have any comments or questions? Just curious what they got all the ties. Is looking at all the. They must have had a mill somewhere. They were running mills all the way along. Yeah. They, they they were setting up mills as they as they went, from what I could find. Yeah. Yeah. Do we, do we know anything about the First Nations guys that were with Rogers? They don't get a lot of uh, credit. They, no, no, no. Often they're not even named. Yeah. So, um, there's one or two of uh, one or two of Moberly's guides are named, and Moberly, he actually Moberly seemed to understand the, the different nations as well, and he was careful like, when exploring different areas to make sure he was using the the guides from from the right area and making sure that they didn't meet each other. He talks about them. You know, being conflicts between the probably the Sequetmec and the Sinaiax. And so he made sure that he sent off his Sequetmec guide before he met up with the Sinaiax. So they definitely talk about them, but they don't, they, they very rarely uh, refer to them by name. They usually just call them Indian guides. They don't except, always uh, say what, what nation they're from. Yeah. Except for the Iroquois. They used yeah. a lot of Iroquois, didn't they? They did, yeah. yeah the, um, the fur traders used, yeah. the, used the Iroquois guides a lot. Well, the Iroquois were really from back east, were they? Yeah. Yeah, they would come with the, yeah. with the fur traders and travel across. Any other questions? Thank you, Kathy.